Marianne, thank you so much for joining me after a really hard day's work um, for you over in Sydney. Can I just start other than by saying it is May the 7th, 2020, which is kind of important to know. Could you just tell us who you are, what you do for a job, who you work with and where you are at the moment? Right, so you've introduced me already. My name is Marianne. I'm the director at the Sydney Medically Supervised Injecting Centre. So um, the reason the date is important is because we had a birthday yesterday. We turned 19 as a service. So 19 years ago, we were the first um, supervised Amazing. injecting facility in the English speaking world. So that was kind of nice for us. Um, not quite the celebration and party that we perhaps normally would have had um, with physical distancing. Um, so I'm based in Sydney in Kings Cross, which is a pretty well known place in Sydney as the red light district. So a lot of um, sale, purchase and use of drugs as well as involvement in the sex industry. And yes, I'm, the building is literally on the main drag in the sort of the business red light district of the, of the street known as the main drag. What was and, the of the question? Oh, as you, so you were in Sydney, Australia. And so describe your average target population who you work with? So we are a low threshold harm reduction service. Normally we would pride ourselves on the fact that our front door is always open during business hours, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year. Um, so COVID has done some strange things to us in that we're actually now managing the flow through the service and people come through in a much more processed way in order to keep everybody safe and have a maximum number of people in certain spaces at the room at, at each time. So it was actually a really hard decision for us to, to lock that front door and have people come in and manage the process. But we target basically anyone in the local area who injects drugs. So as a low threshold service, we literally will have anybody in who is injecting drugs, knowing that injecting anywhere else is by its very nature inherently more dangerous because you don't have the supervision, you don't have the access to people that have necessarily naloxone, trained to manage an airway, um, and certainly other, you know, counsellors and nurses involved that might be able to assist with getting you onto treatment or supporting you with housing or seeing an abscess get sorted or whatever. Um, in reality, the people that we mostly see are very much a more marginalised population. So, um, amongst our frequently attending clients, probably about 50% are either in unstable accommodation or street-based homeless. We see, like most drug services, 75% male, 25% female, a gradually ageing cohort, which is reflective of the gradual ageing of the population of people who inject drugs in Australia, and about 11 or 12% of our folk are identified as being Indigenous, Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, and on average, people have been using for a long time. Um, more than a decade with significant mental ill health and physical comorbidity. So it's kind of the thin end, thin end of the wedge or the pointy end of things, as we often say. So you're working with a group who you would suspect would be incredibly susceptible to infection, malnutrition, mental health problems, no housing. How has COVID impacted on that? population and, and talk a little bit more about the way you've adapted the service to continue to be able to work with them. So I think very early on the thing that was kind of strange for all of us who were glued to the television and finding it very hard to switch off our intake of news was the reality in those early couple of weeks that we were still seeing people that didn't know what we were talking about and asking questions about why we, you know, had masks on or, or offering masks to anybody that was coughing. So that was a real wake-up call for me that, in fact, your everyday existence and your immediate priorities are different depending on who you are. These days, everybody that we see is well aware of, of, of the global situation. Um, so probably the next thing we started noticing was concern and concern, obviously, for their own well-being and the well-being of, of, of their mates and their families but also just the impact of other services having to close. So we started to see people who were hungry. Um, you know, a, a number of the, the services in our, in our local area that provide free food or very vastly reduced, you know, discounted food have had to close their hours as well. Sometimes the services that rely on donations of food, they might be getting them from hotels and from airlines. Well, the hotels and airlines don't have enough, as much food to give away. So then we started to notice that people were just gradually getting hungrier. Um, 
Then there was also an issue about just where do they spend their days. So we would normally very proudly have a policy in our aftercare area after, after somebody's used. The whole point is about connection. So, you know, we would never say you've injected drugs right next, you know, out the door. Out, their whole ethos is the opposite. Stay, have a cup of tea or coffee, hang out with us, do a bit of an activity, do a game that involves some kind of, you know, quirky, you know, comedy way of learning a bit more about a various issue. Whereas obviously we've had to sort of turn that on its head. So people who are street based homeless, if they're not going to hang out here and they're not going to hang out at the Wayside Chapel or they're not going to hang out at other sort of group spaces, where do they go? Um, and what I realised is that when I was walking down the street to and from work, when literally nobody else is on the street, suddenly everybody else on the street was our clients. Um, and they stood out a bit more because when you're homeless, there really is nowhere else to go apart from the street. Um, so these days, I mean, we're still open, although it looks and feels a bit different for the clients. And I have to say, they've just been, they've been spectacular, Adam, in terms of their ability to just kind of respond and roll with the punches in terms of us requiring um, a different way of doing things, having to manage the flow into the building so that people occasionally have to wait a little bit and have to not to get in. But then we only have two clients because it's a little reception area that we've got screening people for a temperature before they came, come in. Um, we've got less capacity in the injecting room in the middle stage now where we had two people per booth with now in order to physically distance and keep them as, as safe as possible. We're down to one per booth. So we've effectively halved at any one time the capacity in, in our stage one and then in stage three. Again, rather than it being set up in a way that is encouraging people to stay, it's set up in a way that's encouraging people not to stay. So it looks and feels different, and yet they've, you know, basically responded with goodwill and good humour. Um, and I'm hoping that's just because they're they're obviously grateful that we're still operating. It's also a beautiful example of you are the antithesis of typical drug and alcohol services. You deliver services in a structureless fashion in order to facilitate access by a client group that need that flexibility and by very definition for them being able to survive on the street, they are resilient, adaptive, flexible. And- They absolutely are, yeah. And are as respectful to you as you are of the choices they make. It's, um, it's, it's lovely to see how well everyone has worked under crisis, but that's because you've been going for 19 years and there is that trust. That's difficult to replicate in traditional services. What's been the impact on drug markets? Look, I'm fascinated by this because as yet, it does not seem to be stark or obvious or all that significant. And I say as yet because I'm sure with all of the other people you're speaking to, there is a generic general sense of things are going to change. In Australia, for example, all of our heroin is imported. We don't um, manufacture heroin in this country, so we are reliant um, largely on what is coming from Southeast Asia. We're not getting drugs um, from, from Afghanistan and elsewhere that obviously are supplying other parts of the world. Our heroin, for example, comes from Southeast Asia, and we know there's a vastly reduced um, number of planes as well as boats coming in from that part of the world. And yet, um, we are not yet seeing any, in any significant manner, people either saying they can't get heroin, the heroin is more expensive, or the purity has significantly reduced. Our numbers in April did go down a bit, um, and that was across the board, but the sense is very much that's more a reflection on the changes to our processes and flow, as well as the fact that one good thing, um, if we can find some good that has come out of this, is that for a lot of our homeless clients, because of the acknowledgement that there is no way for us effectively them to self-isolate, especially if they've had access to testing because they've been symptomatic, they have now got access to temporary accommodation, which is 30 days, <coughs> pardon me, in a hotel. And it's been lovely to see a number of our clients be able to take advantage of those offers. Um, and I think with some of those clients, that's mean, that mean, has meant that they are not using our service as much. Now, that's great if they're accessing treatment um, and if they're reducing the frequency of their injecting. I would 
be distressed to think that there was significant numbers of heroin injection going on um, unsupervised, because obviously that's the whole point, and I would be desperately concerned about the, the possibility of, you know, overdose deaths occurring in, in temporary accommodation, but that I'm aware of, that's not, that's not occurred. Um, so the, the overall reduction in numbers that we've seen in April, our sense at this stage is that's much more reflective of less people on the street and a change in our processes and flows, as opposed to the drugs not being there or available to inject. One interesting thing was though that our numbers of heroin went down more proportionally than our numbers of methamphetamine. So I think the two things um, that I'm sure others of your um, interviewees would have talked about is, I guess the things that people are concerned about is, you know, you push down on, on one thing. It might be ideally that we get people into treatment and we are seeing that, but we also know that for some people you push down here and it pops up somewhere else. And that might mean that people are, are sourcing other substances to use. And the big concern is something like fentanyl and fentanyl analogs. Um, obviously we've got a very clear illicit trade route with, with China. And we know that that's where a lot of the manufacture of the illicit fentanyl analogs, which is driving the, the overdose crisis and the overdose death crisis across North America. So I think there's an ongoing concern as a physically much smaller um, chemical that it's much easier to import because you physically need less quantity of the actual package in order to create the same um, pharmacological impact. Um, that to date, touch wood, has not been what what we're seeing. Um, and I guess because of the um, restrictions on trade and borders, the concern is um, not only that heroin might go down, but something that's locally manufactured, such as methamphetamine, may in fact increase. And so I, I did notice in our April numbers that although methamphetamine also went down, it didn't go down to, to the same degree as heroin did. We've been seeing a gradual increase in the amount of methamphetamine for a number of years now at our service. And I'm wondering whether in the not too distant future, it might actually take over as the, as the most commonly injected drug and um, replace heroin. Do you think at a time of global anxiety, this could be a really dumb question, but it's, it's in my head. Um, do you think a depressant drug like heroin is more useful to get you through? Or do you think a drug that, you know, reduces your need for sleep and food and increases your survival response like crystal meth is kind of still attractive? I told you I thought it was a crap question. Not at all. I, I mean, I don't you think You can just say it's a crap question. I don't think I've ever really understood sometimes the primary drivers. I mean, in our service, for example, absolutely always the predominant class of drug has been a depressant drug versus a stimulant or a psychostimulant drug. Now, amphetamine has obviously changed to crystal methamphetamine over the years, and there has been a gradual increase over the last sort of seven or eight years. But if you lump together um, heroin, oxycodone, morphine, fentanyl, all of the different versions of, 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 of morphine and, and oxycodone, um, it has always been vastly outweighed the numbers of all other drugs put together. I think largely there is something in the self-medication um, hypothesis that in fact the, it is the majority rather than the minority of our clients who I would argue have got significant levels of early childhood trauma such that doing something that makes you forget and taking something that feels like a blanket and helps you cope seems actually a much more um, normal, for want of a better description, response to, you know, your life. And I, I've, you know, said previously, you've got to ask yourself, we've all got to ask ourselves, what would need to have happened in our life such that at the age of 12, it seemed like a reasonable response to our existence to allow somebody else to put a needle in our arm and give us something that was going to make us go to sleep. Um, so I've always understood in some ways that kind of, theory behind the depressant drug use in terms of coping and yeah. sleeping. But the reality is also we know that, that, that almost all heroin users are polydrug users. Um, and the reality is that people will tend to use what is available. And we know that when we had um, the, the end of the heroin glut or the, the heroin drought, late 2000, early 2001, and we thought, well, you know, what other substances might people start to use obviously you know we did get a number of people into treatment and that was fantastic a really good outcome 
for some people, we did see them moving to other drugs, but it wasn't necessarily depressant drugs. I mean, okay. I'm not sure where you were. I think you were around in Australia as well at that time. And I, I yeah, was yeah, in yeah. across at the Curtin Road Centre and, you know, everybody just turned to cocaine. Now, Absolutely. how does that, that doesn't fit the general kind of, you know, if you're thinking about it in terms of a, a reason and a rationale. So I think, look, sometimes, especially for people who have established drug use patterns, there will be an element of, I will maybe use whatever is out there. Um, and that's why I guess I would be concerned about an increased availability of methamphetamine, because I think when drugs are much more readily available, and we know this for everything, legal drugs or illegal drugs, um, pharmaceuticals or non-pharmaceuticals, when, when substances are readily available, more people will use them more of the time. Thank you for giving such an amazing answer to such oh. a rubbish question. <laughs> you rescued, you totally rescued me. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I, I, it, it's fascinating sometimes wondering why. I mean, we see an awful lot of people with where methamphetamine is a drug that they're very frequently using and, you know, being physically present with them when they use it, you can see the levels of paranoia, you know, manifestly skyrocket and result in very obvious distress. And I'm often left thinking, they're not, they're, they're by no means enjoying this. This is not, um, you know, people talk about, well, drug users are, you know, they deserve their own fate. It's not like they have to use them. And there's a, a sense of people are seeking pleasure and therefore we will look down on that. And you look at, you know, I sometimes think, oh, and I don't think I necessarily understand because it's not like, it is not like this is some simple choice and they are enjoying yeah. it. You know, there are definitely people taking substances and yet it is obvious that in the short term, their mental health is t deteriorating as a result. You, you'd have to think maybe people who choose to use crystal meth would potentially, if they had COVID, would potentially be a, a more um, active source of dissemination of the disease just because they're probably very often moving and connecting with more people. I think that's probably another conversation for another time and I'm not going to ask you to give an answer to another rubbish question. So my final, my, my final question is this. You started from an amazing baseline with a group of clients you worked really well with and you've ramped that up. Thinking more broadly across New South Wales, what are the changes in treatment, delivery and policy that are in place now that you hope will become part of drug treatment when COVID starts impacting on our day-to-day -day lives less. What are the lessons we can learn? Where's the silver lining in this? Mm. Yeah, it's a good question. Cause I think if you'd asked me a month ago, it really felt like there was, there was no silver lining. Um, but you're right. I think there, there, there is, and there has to be some good that can come out of this. Um, an acknowledgement of this client group being worthy of treatment full stop, I think is a really, you know, it seems like a basic, very small first step, but I would really highlight this because, um, you know, I've even seen on mainstream commercial television discussion about homeless people and how it's absolutely not acceptable that they should be on the streets. That's only been highlighted because, of course, they were the only people on the street because everybody else had a home to go to. So even at its very most basic level, an acknowledgement that there's an awareness of people being deserving of treatment, regardless of whether they happen to use drugs or not, and an awareness that this is a people, a person first rather than a, you know, a drug user. Um, I think certain types of treatment, so we're... Um, hopefully really going to ramp up access to Buvidal as a, as a depot long-acting um, buprenorphine. And I think we, I, I don't think there's any way we would have got this as quickly off the ground were it not for COVID. There's always all sorts of policy documents and all sorts of review panels and all sorts of, you know, paperwork that needs Guideline. to be done. Guidelines. Yeah. All of that. Um, and, you know, a bit like with telehealth that would have taken, you know, ages um, that through sheer necessity that has been fast track. So I think that's been great. And we've seen, you know, we've seen a couple of clients do marvellously, really just marvellously um, on that. So a new type of a treatment, I mean, we're pretty, it's a, a you know, bit piss poor often generally. I mean, if, if you think of hypertension, I mean, how many different options do we have when somebody's blood pressure is high if the first drug doesn't work, we've got multiple other drug classes and multiple drugs within those drug classes. We've got dozens we can try. What have we got in terms of pharmacotherapy for opiate dependence? 
not a lot. Um, so it's wonderful, I think, to have another treatment modality to be able to offer. Um, Particularly one that allows people not to have to come to a pharmacy every day that gives them freedom to engage in normal non-drug related or non-treatment activities. Totally agree with you. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, for those things, and I, and I guess just the, the focus on the homeless, like um, I, I would, you know, in, in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, the first thing was provide shelter. And I mean, I've, how are we supposed to help with somebody's poorly controlled schizophrenia and dependence on both heroin and methamphetamine when they're living under a bridge in Woolloomooloo? I mean, I just... It's not reasonable to expect us or them to, to do anything other than just focus on where the hell they're going to sleep and what the hell they're going to eat. And, and anything else before you've fixed those two problems is setting someone up to fail. So I think if we could have a really much more of a return to basics and acknowledgement that housing first, if, if we can't find someone a place to call home and feel safe, then we shouldn't be expected to try and do anything else. And this has to be, you know, much more a core and a focus of all of our treatments and, and drug and alcohol need to push that, I think. And I, I, I agree with everything you've said, but by us agreeing with that very basic need as the priority, we also therefore have to acknowledge, as we all do privately, that what we offer so many of our clients is a band-aid in the case of multiple fractures. And we always know that it's skating the surface. And I think you're right. This just demonstrates the importance of civil society and get the basics right before you start trying to do clever shit then, you know, I'm happy to put my hand up and go, yep, I only ever did this much, but give someone a house and a roof, that value could increase quite a bit. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, I, I, I was asked the question, and I'll ask it to you. If you had control of the budget in an area where there was um, a significant proportion of the population living close to or on the poverty line with significant levels of unemployment and significantly high levels of problematic drug use, where would you put your money and would you open a, an injecting facility? Um, and I'm, I presume the person at the time, you know, was expecting me to, you know, um, talk about the benefits of a supervised injecting facility. And I'm sure it's no surprise to you perhaps what I answered, but where would you put your money? Housing first. Housing first, regular food, access to care. Basically go, we know every day the priorities to you are where are you going to sleep and what are you going to eat. We will remove the need for you to stress yourself over those priorities. We can be useful and helpful. That builds trust. It gives people space to think, wow, all of that emotional energy and stress that I would spend every day just knowing I was going to wake up the next morning somewhere safe, that's been taken away. Like, yeah, it's... Mm. Social determinants of health. The conditions under which we are born, live, work and play determine so much more of our future sort of um, trajectory in life than anything doctors can do down the track. I'm going to end it there because I think we're going to use that last quote as a, as a kind of a short kind of gif because it's <laughs> absolutely right, Marianne, but you just encapsulated it so beautifully. So look, um, thank you for sharing with the world how flexible and adaptive client-focused services can ramp up and function in the most ridiculous of services. And thank you for reminding everyone that without food and shelter, we're all going to be really limited about the things we can do. Um, so thank you. And I look forward to, um, well, you know. It's been Sydney. a pleasure. I look forward to talking about this, not necessarily wholly on the other side, but maybe over the hump. Yeah, that would be, uh, that would, it would be, it would be good when things have returned to normal and you can have a proper 19th birthday party. Yes, um, that's right. Well, well, who knows how old we might be by then. <laughs> all right. Marianne, thank you so much. Stay safe and um, pleasure. Okay. You too. Thanks, Adam.
Just taking it one day at a time Still don't know what I'm trying to find Really I don't mind Cause I'll be fine Yeah I'll be fine Yeah No longer focused on yesterday And I don't care The rest will say Whatever they want What's left to say What's left to say